And I think we're done here. Let me know if you want to see part two. Let me know if you want to see part two. Um, part two, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't watched the first part, go watch it. Because today we're gonna add new things and improve the old ones. And since me from two years ago didn't know what the hell he was doing and were a complete mess, I made a new project. It includes sprite manager and animation classes from my previous projects. And to make sure everything works, I drew this dude. He's supposed to move like this. And he does. I never doubted myself. Now we need to add ray casting. I didn't want to make the same mistakes I did in my previous attempt. So I decided to find out how smart people do it. And I came across this tutorial by a person called... Load van der Ven. Such a cool name. So in the first part we used the Euclidean distance, which meant we had to do lots of corrections for the walls to appear correctly. The new method we're gonna use today works the exact same way except it uses the perpendicular distance. This means we don't have to deal with this, this, and this. We have a new variable called camera plane which is basically a vector of the player's current direction turned 90 degrees. And the ray direction is now a position of the current stripe on the camera plane relative to the player's position. Everything else is exactly the same. The code is beautiful now, but the player doesn't see any difference. Sad life of a programmer. Alright, now I want to color the sides of the walls in different colors. We now have a stripe class which will make things a lot easier. The side variable will determine which side of the wall we hit. And we use the cell step to calculate its value. Then we color the walls based on that variable. Let's see. This side is purple. This side is green. This side is blue. And this side is yellow. Good job, man. Well, thank you. Now we're gonna add a map. I just copy-pasted the code from the previous part. Hopefully we won't have to change anything. Let's see. Oh, so we do have to change something. Okay, every stripe will store both the horizontal and vertical distances. It should work now. Oh, dear God. What is this? Alright, I decided to print everything on the console to figure out the problem. Aha. Uh -huh. I have no idea what I'm doing. At that point I established that if I solve this equation, I can fix the problem. But since I get scared when I see geometry, I asked my fans on social media for help. They immediately gave me the formula, which I'm really thankful for, but it was useless. Here's how I fixed it. In the first part, if you remember, we fixed the fisheye effect by multiplying the distance by cosine. In other words, we transformed the Euclidean distance into a perpendicular distance. Now we need to do the opposite, so we need to divide the distance by cosine. I'ma call it true distance. Now we're talking. Do you know what's better than colors? Textures! Lots of textures! In order to draw them, we need to find the difference between the corner of the wall and the position of the hit. We'll use that difference to get the correct stripe from the texture. We're using the side variable to determine the axis of the collision. It works! And at the same time, it doesn't. I just forgot to scale the stripes vertically. There we go. For some reason I want to turn this into a horror game. And every horror game needs to have a bloody text on the wall. Here's how it looks in the game. So creepy. Why don't you show the other side? Uh, you don't need to see that. Is it because the text is mirrored? N no Then show it. Okay, fine. I'll show it to you. Let me just... There you go, I have nothing to hide. Now let's add the floor. Surprisingly, adding the floor was simple. First we need the vertical position of the camera. You can think of it as the height of the player. And since I put the camera in the middle of the screen, our player looks something like this. Oh yeah. We also need an imaginary vertical plane that stands one unit in front of the camera. This plane represents our screen. We're gonna cast a ray that starts from the camera, goes through the screen, and stops when it hits the floor. Now we just need to find the horizontal distance between the camera and the floor hit point. But look at that. These things form a triangle, and so do these things. And by angle-angle theorem, the name sucks by the way, these two triangles are similar which means we can use proportion to find x. We know the height of the player, which is the z position of the camera. And we also know the y position of the current row relative to the screen. So 1 divided by row y is equal to x divided by camera z, which means x is equal to camera z divided by row y. Now we just need to repeat the same thing for the other rows. We're halfway there and I switched to the top down view. Here's our screen and here's our player. We need the player's field of view, which we can get using this formula. Then we multiply it by the distance of the current row we just calculated to get this. This line represents our current row. We go through that line step by step and draw the floor the same way we draw the walls. Then we repeat everything for the other rows. I hope you're satisfied with my explanation. Hey, I thought you said this was gonna be easy. 
I said you said this is gonna be easy. Shut up, okay? We're drawing the floor before drawing the walls. And it works! If you ignore the fact that you can take a nap between frames. The main reason is obviously my PC being from the Stone Age period. Also, it's because we're drawing each pixel as a sprite. So let's fix that using some magic. Avada Kedavra! Now we're drawing the pixels into a buffer image. Then we're putting that image into a texture, putting that texture into a sprite, and finally, we draw the sprite. Yes, FML is weird. Anyway, now the game works faster. I also added shading if you didn't notice. Now I want to make the player look up and down. This is called changing the pitch. Here's a side view of the player. This angle is the current vertical direction that the player is facing. This is our vertical plane from before. And this distance is the pitch that tells us how far we should move everything vertically. By assuming that the vertical plane is one unit in front of the player, we can set our pitch to be the tangent of the player's vertical angle. Let's subtract that pitch from row Y. Okay, the floor is looking good. I might even say too good. I just forgot to move the floor from the center. And now it's looking good. Just good. Let's move the walls as well. Real quick, this video is sponsored by my Patreon page. If you want to gain access to devlogs of my future projects and videos, including exclusive content, consider becoming a member. Now let's go back to the video. And now we have more control freedom. Since the game feels a bit empty, why don't we add some decorations? Like this barrel for example. At first I tried to follow Lodef's tutorial, until I saw this. Why do we have to use matrices? What's wrong with using simple arithmetic? So that's what I did instead. I made a new vector that will store all of the decorations. Now we need to find the distance between the barrel and the player. Since we switched to using the perpendicular distance, we can't simply use the Pythagorean theorem here. So how do we find the perpendicular distance between two points? After googling for a bit, I came across this article. First we construct a line that goes through the player. The slope of this line is the tangent of the player's current direction minus 90 degrees. We'll call that slope A. Now we need to find the shortest distance between the barrel and the line. Let's call that distance D. Next we drop a super vertical line from the barrel to the line. We'll call its length F. This gives us a triangle. And what do we do when we have a triangle? We form another triangle. That's right! We form another triangle using our slope. And look, these angles are the same, these angles are the same, which means these angles are the same as well. Therefore, these triangles are similar. And that gives us this proportion. We can find C using the Pythagorean theorem. And to calculate F, we need to find the absolute difference between the Y coordinates of the barrel and this intersection. Since the intersection lies on the line, we can simply multiply the barrel's X coordinate by the slope to find its Y coordinate. And there we have it! The perpendicular distance between the player and the barrel. We're gonna scale the barrel's sprite using our distance. For now, we're just gonna draw them on the side. I also made the map bigger and added lots of barrels to it. This looks terrible. I'm just gonna assume it's working. Now we need to draw them in the correct positions. Here's how we're gonna do it. Here's the player and the barrel. First we find the angle between the player's direction and the direction from the player to the barrel. We calculate its tangent and divide it by the tangent of the player's field of view to get a value between negative 1 and 1. Then we use that value to get the position of the barrel on the screen. The hardest part was finding the angle itself. Also it wasn't working correctly before because I forgot to convert the angles to radians. I'm drawing one barrel for now. And it seems to be working. Are you sure about that? What? Of course I'm sure. What would you know? Look behind you. And why would I look? Oh. Huh. I don't know why this is happening. I'm just not gonna draw it when it's outside the field of view. And now it's working. But as it happens with programming, fixing one bug leads to another. Turns out this flickering was caused by integer overflow because I was using short instead of int. Now that we have working barrels, it's time we add depth. We have a vector of stripes, and we have a vector of decorations. First we sort them by their distance value. Then we just draw them on the screen starting from farthest to closest. Yep, it's that easy. Since I can't just mix two vectors together, I'm checking if there are farther standing decorations before drawing every stripe. Alright, we now have decorations. Obviously this method is not perfect because of bugs like this. But if you close your eyes and put your hands like this, you won't notice them. Next I want to add this awesome looking fire animation. I added a boolean variable for decorations to check if they're animated or not. If the decoration is animated, we're gonna draw an animation instead of a static sprite. And let's not forget to update it. This looks awesome. Next I decided to give the player a hint. And obviously he's gonna hold a torch. Because we're making a horror game. I even lowered the render distance for immersion. This looks good so far, but it feels like the player is flying. To make it seem like he's walking, we're gonna add hand bobbing. I came up with this movement using sine and cosine. We just need to give it a value between negative 1 and 1. Now that's a lot better. 
yeah we also need to move it to the center when the player stops. And this code does exactly that. Don't judge me, it's not as easy as it sounds. Now I want to work on the textures. We have a new brick wall, a wall with a skeleton, two walls with text, a wall with a mug, and a new floor. I also made the barrel smaller and changed the fire cauldron. Now let's see how the game looks now. The game looks fantastic. Now to completely turn this into a horror game, we need to add some sort of a threat. And that threat is none other than Steven. Before adding him to the game, I made some changes to his appearance. Here's how he looked before, and here's how he looks now. Obviously Steven will have his own class, and we're gonna draw him the same way we draw the decorations. Where is he? Oh my god, you freaking scared me. Yeah, let's make him turn around. Here's how we're gonna do it. This is the player, and this is Steven. First we need to cast a ray from the player to Steven. Then we'll draw a line perpendicular to that ray. After that we just have to get the angle between the line and Steven's current direction. We just divide that angle by the frame angle to get the correct frame. There we go. Now that we have Steven in the game, let's turn him into a threat. I wanna make him follow me. Yeah, that sounds weird. For pathfinding, I'm using the A-star algorithm for my pathfinding project. You can check out this video if you want to learn more about it. We're gonna find the shortest path between the player and Steven. Then we're gonna move Steven to the next cell in that path. After that, we calculate the shortest path again because the player can move to another location. Then we repeat the whole process. We're gonna turn Steven towards the cell he's going to. And it's working! He can find me even when I'm behind the wall. This is so creepy. But running away from him doesn't seem challenging. To make Steven more threatening, we're gonna use something called rubber banding. When Steven is too far from the player, he's gonna walk faster. And once he gets close, he's gonna slow down. I know that's not exactly rubber banding, I just couldn't find a better name. I also added Steven on the minimap to see his movement. And as you can see, he's changing his speed based on the distance. The last thing we need to do is to show something scary when he catches us. Well it is scary for me, but it needs to be scary for everyone. We're just gonna show a little screamer that will shake randomly. This is the only time we're using randomness so I'm using rent. But you won't see the screamer because this stupid Steven is too slow to catch me. Wait what the hell? I didn't do that. No no I was joking! That was a joke Steven please! <laughs> no it's a dead end! No! 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 <laughs> <clears throat> I need to change my pants. The game turned out to be amazing. I don't know when I'm gonna release the next part though. Probably soon. Big thanks to all of my awesome Patreon supporters. Especially Victor Fernandez. Don't forget to join our Discord server. And be sure to like and what the